most of you already know, should we? Those of you who don't know soon, soon enough, um, because we're going to talk about herself, her life, and her work. That would Something take like that. longer than an hour and a half. Okay. But, <coughs> anyway. Here I am. Here you are. I am. Thank you very much. And thank you. What? And thank you for the, this, the opportunity to do this extraordinary thing to challenge my age denial. But also, <laughs> but also two things. One is to celebrate the people who I'm calling freelancers, freelancer consultants, trainers, scholars, and um, my compatriots, but also the era we've been through and what it, uh, what it, uh, what it has to teach. The other bit is, I have to say this, that um, I'm, I'm a Ronnie Action History Society fan. I think I've missed one conference because I had to work. Mm. Otherwise, I've been to all of them. There is something extraordinary about your storytelling, and I mean that kindly, that um, feeds good consultancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I am by trade a person who, who facilitates conversations, enables people to think through, get through, understand, make more sense of their work. So it's unusual for me to sit in front of people that I haven't heard speak yet. So what I'd appreciate is, would you mind saying who you are briefly, yeah? And if there is anything about this account of this, what is essentially a group of people, not an institution, yeah? More a myriad group of people who evolved for a point in time, yeah? Were very mm -hmm. active, vibrant. And <clears throat> an interesting question is their future. So, uh, and that isn't my this maverick. So I'd be appreciate the name and if you have no idea what I'm talking about that's fine and I'll just be very careful and gentle. Um hello Colin. You want have me you to ever start? Been, yeah, yeah go on. Have you ever and if anyone haven't been a freelancer? I'm sorry? Have you ever freelanced? You have. I have you yes. are yes. Yes. I uh, <laughs> in nineteen eighty seven I became a freelancer. But then I then I got involved little by little with uh, David Billis and company mm. and moved to the LSC. I got more and more drawn into that and less and less into freelancing. But I've been doing freelance work outside of institutions pretty well ever since then. Mm. So it's part of this extraordinary unsung group. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Jane Humphreys. Um, voluntary sector hack, really. Um, <laughs> until recently, mostly worked in the voluntary sector, mostly at second tier level. Yes. So that accounts as voluntary service, supporting the development of foundations that are almost a long way away from the coal place. Um, worked, worked a lot with freelancers. Mm -hmm. um, um, had a tiny amount of experience of doing it myself. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. You've touched us. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, my name's Mike Locke. Yes, I have been a freelancer. Yes. This. Um, and um, University of East London and mm. work with mm. a number of people who are freelancers, sometimes freelance as well as working at the university. Mm. Yeah. And then volunteering in England, and I've got a visiting role at the University of Kent. Mm. Right? Yes, we've used a lot of your work. <laughs> Tim, in splendid isolation in the middle. Tim uh, Cook. <coughs> No, I've never done freelance. I've just um, I've, I've become increasingly obsessed with the whole idea of committees, mm -hmm. and um, just to say that when I was nine or ten, I used to pick the world's best cricket eleven. <laughs> I now genuinely write down and try and create and write down the best committee I can possibly think of. Gosh. Okay. We must go and get. Sometimes. <laughs> so that's my. I'm still chairing the committee. I said I'm you know, too old to chair committees, but they won't let me go. So. Don't blame them. Excuse me, the gentleman behind you just joined us. Just oh, briefly, who are you and have you ever been? Yes, John Mason is my name, and uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm the Housing Association chairman. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hello. I'm Hilary Bernard, and I've been a freelancer since 1991. Yes, and you're one of us. So. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Hi, I'm Bill Rushbrook. I remain here, retired lecturer, manager of studies, non profit, done some freelance, mm. not much. That's right. That's, thank you, Bill. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm Bill Waterhouse. I haven't had a proper job since 1989, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. And I ran, ran in terror from um, the, the dread that is um, the voluntary sector um, and haven't looked back since. <laughs> Hello. Uh, meet, meet a Zimic. I'm, I've been mostly freelance my entire life except for six glorious years at the Home Office running a very large research program with lots of freelancers working for me. So. Hello, Arthur. I am Karen Deal. I uh, used to run the Media Trust, which I set up 20 odd years ago. Yes. I'm now the chairman of the Community Channel, which I also set up, which is a separate from the Media Trust now. And uh, doing that part time, I'm probably going to be taking on some freelance work for the first time ever. But I'm also doing a project which is uh, unpaid at the moment around people who are founders in the charitable and social enterprise sector, called, calling it Social Founders. And it's, uh, to be able, it's, uh, it's a network of people who sort of meet up and discuss. The, the joys and the horrors and the challenges of being a fun founder <laughs> in the sector. But it's also about getting founder stories out into the media more widely, so that it's not all the negative stuff like the Camilla stories. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Alison, I just ask people who they are and whether they've done any freelancing. I should be able to answer for you, really, shouldn't I? Has this stuck 20 minutes outside Finns of the Park Station oh. and her all down here? Yes. <laughs> I'm Alison Penn, chair of the Forum Church Society. And freelanced. Yes. Now the my tail, my tail, and, and part I call it Maverick because I think at times, mm, ever since eighty four, eighty five, not being properly what my mother called having a proper job, uh, and she got tired of saying it in the end. I think when I first wrote something, she thought there was a product to it really. Uh, and I didn't have unwanted babies or anything. Uh, I've been part of a group of people, or groups of people, who didn't quite fit traditional management consultancy in major firms, grew out of a, and I will touch on it particularly, a time when being alternative was mainstream, with a slight passion, and also of a passion for that which is Chinese. And they, the Chinese talked about people who dwell on water margins, people who are not in mainstreams, but something about, like with ports where people come and go, so there's a richness of mixing and types, yeah? But there is a transient to it. And it brings, a, it brings, a, it's, it brings its own paradoxes, but also its value that's not going to be in, in the conven conventional, comfortable way of doing things. So in lots of ways, I'm romanticising the role of the freelancer, particularly at a particular uh, time, really, as people who lived on the, on, the, on the water margins. So in that sense, I'm not talking about all freelancers, but a group, an ever-changing group of people who started back in the 70s, and I suppose if I face it, and that's for discussion at the end, there's a conversation about their place and their <coughs> longevity now as the sector changes so dramatically. Um, so in a way, I, am, I, I said to Colin, management development, yeah, and talked about it as rise and fall, uh, and realised that it may be mildly uncomfortable if, as a social historian, what you're used to is the notion of the changing you see the nature of the experience or journey of an organisation, whereas what I'm talking about is something which is more close to sets of networks, people who identified across uh, in terms of, of meeting and being self very self-organising mm -hmm. and who grew up at a particular time. And one of the conversations we probably never resolve, well there'll be two conversations, us mavericks never resolve, which is what do we call us? Are we consultants? Are we facilitators? I have very experienced colleagues who don't like being called consultant, who want to be called a specialist, 
uh, they may actually facilitate, they may do evaluation, but there is no one name, but they are freelance. The other thing we don't resolve is how much we charge. That's not a conversation that we comfortably have, really. Now, my beginnings are having done salaried work in the 70s and 80s, and then went freelance. I jumped. I only had a beetle car and two planes, and we went into accommodation. It was possible. So I want to start us there. So Tim and I met well before then, yeah, and learnt the train there. But I want to start then to tell you about this group. But also, and I, you can see it under, I say, we want to talk about the changing nature of support and services for improving, sustaining third sector organisations, 79 to 200 and 2016, which actually is more about the coming and going of Conservative government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't cope with post-2016. Um, but also, I want to argue, and I'd be happy for the likes of Colin and others to challenge me, but the, the notion that for a point in time there was community of interest or communities of interest that worked across the, set, the researchers and the practitioners that was very good. And there was a lot of learning into weaving, uh, and therefore a conversation about how that happened and how that stopped happening. Um, I am, I have been since I think 84 freelance, and I have worked with third sector organisations. I am not a specialist in any sort of type of, of specialist organisation. So my background is I've worked with a plethora of organisations in. Uh, England and then now in Scotland since two, 1979. And I'm kind of not talking about Scotland, except I will fall into Scottish. So you all heard me talk about third sector organisations, which you would think of as community, yeah, mm, what do you call them? Voluntary community sector <coughs> organisations, what, that's what you're used to? And I forget about that. So I've been, I've tried to be ordered for you because I know that researchers are ordered people and given you definitions. Are you all right with that? But can we ignore all that and plunge on? Um, it's one of the great sadnesses is that if you soon won't write about us, we will be gone. That's what I predict. And we will therefore disappear in history, yeah, in the miasma of history. And anybody who writes PhDs in the future about third sector organisations who have survived will wonder how come they got the advice, help, support. Yeah? They got. Because if you're a certain side corporate organisation, you can have in house or buy people who do management development, career development, HR, yeah? all those things. Well, the question that you might ask yourself, especially if you ran organisations, is. Who did you buy to do those things? Because you wouldn't have been able to afford having them in-house. And some of the Council of Monterey Service would have offered up those services, but that only goes so far, and the sector is hugely rich. Yeah. But also, you can't argue, or you can try and argue with me, about whether somebody whose job it is to come to do your evaluation <coughs> to facilitate a difficult conversation with your team or to help you through your HR problems that people can do that values neutral. And I would argue, you can't do those things values neutral. So the question is, how does a group of people evolve that are values empathetic, yeah, to offer those services? Yeah. And the only person who I've found so far who described us, and I've said on page two in the middle, I've quoted it because it's complimentary, is Barry Knight. I know. First, the pioneering pioneer. He's, talk, he's writing in ET3, looking back. First, the pioneering pioneering efforts of a small number of exceptionally talented. So, please, I'd like that as a as a T-shirt. Freelancers and trainers and consultants who had witnessed high rates of illness, anxiety, and breakdown amongst workers dealing with the sharp end of voluntary services in homelessness, alcohol, and drug abuse. Since these pioneers had a background in voluntary organisations shaping much of their culture and values, they were acceptable and managed to help voluntary organisations assimilate a new language from within the sector. So he celebrates us briefly, but also he's hinting very heavily about how that group of people felt about management, which they didn't like the term. But also, because as you'll see, the obvious happens. 
which is managerialism, begins to arise. But then before you do that, the one thing I'm keen for, to set the scene for is 60s, 70s, 80s, working as a researcher, looking at evaluating services for homeless people and arguing about the need for services for, for women alcoholics, yeah, campaigning, supporting the Campbell Council on Alcoholism and Elspeth Kyle and people like her who supported volunteers and tipped me into committees and said, learn how to write reports and do minutes. Yeah, vibrant, extraordinary time. That time in the 60s and 70s and early 80s gave birth to an enormous number of organisations for people with alcohol problems, issues or homelessness, uh, alternatives to prison, but also right across the sector would be in community development. Yeah, there were the community development projects. Can some of you go back? Yeah. So it was an extraordinary kind of post-Second World War type of time of energy and alternative to complement the welfare state. And in it, all it felt like was extraordinary to every time you turned around with something else born, yeah, for people who otherwise would be in prison or locked up or, yeah, seen as vagrant. All these things became possible because people were realising the welfare state couldn't go that far. And anyway, we were the first generation of people who got fully fed, given um, cod liver oil, and then uh, educated by the state for free. Yeah, And so we were hot to be useful, serve, but also we were troubled because we were left and anarchistic and, you know, feminist and all those things. So it was an extraordinary time. But it wasn't only an extraordinary time <coughs> in Camberwell, where I set off, but in London and across uh, the major cities, but it was in the world of management development, yeah? The notion that organisations up till the 60s were very large institutional. Are you thinking Henry Ford and his idea of large factories? Yes, massive systems for making things. Well, that had become well established as how you did things, yeah, based on cohorts and armies and all that kind of thing. And then there was this wave where this thing called organisation development, which came to challenge Taylorism and, and Henry Ford, saying, no, loosen up organisation, flatten them and they will be more productive, break them up, make them able to adjust to growing capitalist or global capitalism that's growing up, loosen them up, and make them in some ways more democratic. So it wasn't coming from us. We were just at a time beginning to study, evaluate services for homeless people, and find that there were left-wing people in, in management schools saying, yeah, listen to people on the front line, don't believe in command structures, flatten it, rethink leadership as something that was about servants and support. So that was happening all around us. But a lot of that alternative way of approaching organisations was fed by the beginnings of the therapies that were around. So force field analysis and Kurt Levine, they were all there refining what it meant to support people through mental illness, but also what emotional intelligence meant. So just the birth of the Centre for Voluntary Organisations, am I right, goes back to the Tavistock Institute, yes? It goes right back. It goes back to Brunel. Brunel yeah. and yeah. Elliot Jakes. Elliot yeah. Jakes. Yeah. And yeah. Elliot Jakes, yes, Elliot yes. Jakes people, oh. who were, yes, who yeah. were thinking alternative and using therapeutic techniques. Yeah, they were applying social... Buying um, psychoanalysis to social yes. analysis. So, exactly psychoanalysis, social analysis, and in therefore became part of organisation analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So people who were being traditional managers in command structures were put through most extraordinary psychodynamic experiences for two or three days that cracked my, most of them up, actually, to bring out people who were high on emotional intelligence so that they would make better managers. They weren't just about roles and structures, yeah? They're about relationships. So that was all happening in the bigger picture, happening in the management schools. So the whole of the, all, the way in which you ran your organisation out there was happening. And there was us saying, ooh, how exciting, but also how compatible with the way in which voluntary organisations seem to want to run, i.e. democratic, flat structures, inclusive, yeah? All those things. So it was a very extraordinary time. And uh, I was working with a woman called Frankie Armstrong, 
a, as an action research team, and two left-wing management consultants took us under their wing, and we ended up going to management schools in which they lied about our trade to make it sound ordinary. But what was extraordinary was we had to be careful because they didn't have any women's loos, because we were both women, <laughs> um, because the management schools didn't have loos for women, they only had them for men, which might be, it's very, it's very modern topic at the moment. So, can you send, you got the sense of the energy that was around at that time. So here is the likes of me looking at services for homeless people before I worked with Frankie and moving amongst organisations very easily who are um, like Cyrenians, like Cyrenians down in Canterbury, wanting to bring the, the community sense of religious relationships to homeless people. So not only alternative in terms of, of therapeutic community, but actually community in the true religious sense. So we're bringing homeless people down from London to Canterbury on a farm to say, you know, see your, t your time out here. And they used volunteers to run it. And so they were burning, burning out, yes. They would put them, the young people now, and they, by this time they seem very, very young. Yes, yeah, 16, 18 put on the front line to work with, with people whose lives were very chaotic and to support them. And these people were being burned out in six months intervals. Yeah, they would go home worn out and exhausted, which was not healthy, but also some of the people who, homeless people, weren't exactly flattered by being supported by people who they liked very much who then had to go, yeah? So people like me, Oh, so young and naive. Arrived to say to these workers, I think you need to think about how you use your time, yeah? You need to manage your time. I got hit by a tomato. So I was, you know, they knew I knew that I, I thought that we were compatible, but I get hit by a tomato. And the reason I got hit by a tomato is because I said you need to manage. You need to think about management with a small m, meaning get hold of what you do and the time you have, yeah? And what it costs you in what you do, yeah? Otherwise, you'll have more than you can do and you'll have nothing that tells you you're worth it, yeah? And the world won't be any different either. And so that message was both totally compatible with their experience, but they didn't want to hurt the word management because that was capitalist, yeah? That was about control. It wasn't about being one with... And especially down in Canterbury, you were meant, they were meant to live as if they were... The resident, yeah? So it was a very shaping thing to be treated so. Uh, and yet, to me it seemed, I'd started the journey because the tomato was just, yeah, a learning experience. <laughs> and I needed to think hard about how to put across time management. But also, back to Tim's point, was... Otherwise, if I, and I was moonlighting, I admit it, so you can tell me off. I was moonlighting all this time. Yeah? I didn't learn this by researching, I'm sorry, Tim. I didn't learn this by evaluating math cool. I learned it by sitting in for hours, talking to the staff, yeah? going to the Campbell Council, learning how to do meetings, learning what was extraordinary about meeting and doing meeting skills. Yeah? Apprenticeship, have a go, have a go, all the way through. So a lot of management actually meant give order and form and shape. So a lot of it, what was doing, was really trying to help, if you like, under-organised or only semi-organised systems, yeah, be more formal, be more organised, more thought out, self-aware, yeah, conscious of things. In no way were we, at that point, in the early 70s, 80s, teaching management as into managerialism, yeah, no command structures, no efficiency rules. This was just get yourself together, be clear what you're doing and what you're trying to do, yeah? Yeah? And be upfront and clear about it and have good meetings and all those things. But certainly when I was working in the action research team, what Frankie and I found is we outlived the, t the staff teams. The time we finished the project, yeah, they'd already turned over. Um, so we realised there was something more to be doing than, than that, really. And uh, being a feminist, I was busy, very alert to issues of power and power relationships and command structures, yeah? Because you think Green and Common was that at that time, yeah? Which was not formally an organisation. It was a network of people, women, yeah? 
who did a kind of phone tree when something was about to happen. A phone tree was through, yeah. And so I got absolutely fascinated by ways of organising that weren't caught and ribbon bound by the notion of being an organisation all that time. So that was very interesting for me. But also I, want, I realised that things were fast changing and therefore what was it that was extraordinary in terms of values? And that's why I tried to catch bottom of page three. Time to write for framing and developing theories about programmes for management, organisation development, intervening in organisations at their request on values of intrinsic motivation that the work itself <coughs> worked to sustain you. An obsession, I think, by this time. Remember something about uh, Mary Tudor died. She said she didn't have Calais carved on her heart. There were times when I thought, I'm going to have just be clear about what it is. <laughs> what was it? Somebody said, you don't care what you're doing as long as you're clear. And it was just like, I'm going to have that there in. So clear expectations, high participation, but something about the use of power and social justice were there somewhere. But just as that's happening, another definition of managerial is coming. And I realised in writing this, um, I realised in writing this, what was happening is something that, you've, that you as social historians have taught me, which is right from 1800s onwards, the march of professionalism of social welfare, all the way through... Yeah, providing internationally, locally, yeah, was being professionalised for very good reason. The gentleman over there from housing associations is the most clear example of the way in which the administration, organisation and management of, say, housing is highly professionalised. And what is extraordinary, and I'd love you to get excited about it, which is how come and for how long or organisations that are highly professional, like housing associations, going to keep the notion of volunteer boards, stroke committees, as ultimately, yeah, the oversight come finger of the regulator. So I hadn't realised all the time. I thought the, the march was the march of the big M managerial, and what I'd missed was the undercurrent of professionalisation that was coming through the sector and hardly surprising given later developments. And on page five... So in pages... We oh, have you the, don't have pages. They're not, they're not yet, but they're not the same as your pages. Oh, what, <laughs> oh I'm sorry. As I tried to uh, make, you tried to line them up. I tried to line them up. I didn't succeed, but I tried. So we would be... That's, if you want to compare... OK, them, I'll go by yours so and ignore my notes. That's right. Where am I? And um, by the way, just as, a, as I didn't want to say too much or not be clear enough, I thought I'd run a thread through. One is about housing associations and the other is the groups that hung on mostly to the notion of flat collective structures, which an example of which is the women's organisations, rape crisis, women's aids, yeah? They're not the only ones that did, but, but I, cut, I um, gained a quite considerable number of scars and um, <laughs> remained defiantly committed to how they were trying to run those organisations as alternative, yeah, uh, flattened structures. So, so I think if I'm going on this, I'm going to take you to four, please. Can I take you to page four? Um, it says 79 to 97. Mm -hmm. 97 is marked by the fact that I went to Edinburgh from London. Um, but I want to take you back to 97 because with all that high energy and exhilaration about alternative ways of doing things, but also the notion of trying to consolidate them, formalise them, yeah, settle them, establish them. Uh, and so we're at the top, you see the landmarks, the state stirs. Yes, the state stirs. And this is a lot, to, thanks to Alison, actually, a lot of this. But um, just as we were stirring and getting exhilarated, Charles Handy writes a report on the effectiveness of the voluntary sector. He writes a book called Understanding the Voluntary Sector, which I took personally, and thought he didn't. Um, he also intervened with the um, YM YMCA and altered it from voluntary sector 
over to beginning to look like a private sector. But we had a whole <coughs> raft of things happening in the early 80s about, now I look back, a scrutiny of the voluntary sector because the state was beginning to think this is where we're going to put much of the, pri the public sector would soon be taken up. By the That's my understanding in retrospect. But also we had a number of um, scandals in the private sector which led to the Cadbury report and Nolan, yes, because the private sector puts the chief officer on the board, allows the chief officer to be on the board, and some, in many cases the chief officer is also the chair. Yes, just thinking of founder syndrome and all sorts mm -hmm. of power issues. Um, and that was found not to be kind to um, stakeholders and uh, investors, and hence Cadbury and then Nolan. And anything that was happening to do with cab with private sector in terms of, like Karina, then filtered through public sector, and the, pro <coughs> the third sector begins to find that funders start saying, we think you should, yeah, obey Cadbury, even though we did anyway, and why not in include Nolan as your code of conduct, yeah? It's filtering right through each time, third sector. So we have that fascination by that sector, so what, when we were busy worrying about getting people organised, then management, big M management, was beginning to colonise the language, the way of thinking, the way of working. At the same time, there was a huge growth of organisations through which we freelancers could work. LVSC, London Monetary Service Council, which I understand is just merged and possibly disappeared. NCVO had a pool of consultants, Charity Aid Foundation. Do some of you are too young, but um, Michael Brophy, mm -hmm. Michael Brophy, mm -hmm. Michael Brophy. Yes, mm -hmm. we would. I had just gone freelance, offering myself training people in management on frontline organisations. Um, the Charity Aid Foundation itself has, was developing a pool of consultants that they would aid to come. Diana Leet. Diana Leet yep. mm -hmm. did a study of the use of this pool. So it was the first study of consultants, yeah, of this pool. We went along, a couple of us, me and Sadie Andorondak, another uh, just consultants who provide stuff with frontline organisations, to be there because it was about management consultancy. And then there was a big fight from behind me about um, pro bono. People saying the trouble with pro bono, they don't seem to know what they're doing, to which we said, well, pay them <laughs> and buy it in the sector. And then there was this growl from the stage who said, who are these people? Who are they? And Dinah, who was in mid-sentence, stopped, looked down and said, uh, I, uh, and um, one of the compass, Mike Hudson from Compass, yeah, said, um, freelance consultants. And Michael said, who polices them? <laughs> who, who, who accredits them? And I remember, because Sandy and I looked at each other, because it's like, nobody. <laughs> nobody did, yeah? We, we just floated off, became <laughs> consultants, did service, and if we got used, we survived, and if you didn't, you died, yeah? But there was also a sense you can't do that and remain isolated and, and get cred. You needed to find a way to keep alive, have credibility beyond you. But also, one of the real drivers of networking for us mavericks is how do mavericks acknowledge the reality that you are competitive and yet find affiliation. So that's what my... Brophy did for us in a way was make us realise that you can't just exist as a kind of tadpole in a you know sort of mud pool. Yeah, you have to find some framework of working. And since none of us belong to any institutions, we needed to begin to <coughs> find the extent to which we could network. And that was the birth of the Management Development Network, which fitted back to something called the Fittleworth Group. Yeah, it had been coming for a long time. It's just find a way in which we affiliated to what is essentially still an unincorporated network, dedicated to finding a way of bringing us together so we weren't so isolated, but more importantly, that met enough 
to talk about how we worked. So we upgraded each other, found out how good each other was or wasn't, yeah? But got in material in. So we were doing that at the same time as the director of social change, yeah? My, Michael, mm, whatever his name is, yes? Norton. Norton, you're right. Um, was, was director of social change doing courses, LVSC, MCVO, yeah? Charity Aid Foundation. Then the Open University Business School starts setting up its own uh, diploma in management, yes. Um, and then they start asking us, freelancers, to come to talk to them about how they set up the diploma. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, very flattering. Um, voluntary aid, you're born, you are born. The SN, born later, yes, is that right? Arvac was born, Arvac. I know. You don't have to look sad, it's all right. But the uh, Open University Business School came out of the cooperatives unit. They were coming through that with the same value drive? Yeah, but it yeah. emerged out of that cooperative associated, didn't it? And that's Rob Patton and... Patton um, Corporate for that, and then it became the cooperative bit. Became management development. Well, it just, in, in what do you call it, evaporated and... Business school. It evaporated. That's a very nice way of putting it. Mm -hmm. But it was what I like about that is it shows you the values were comfortable. Yeah. Rob Patton yeah. and Chris Cornforth, they just found that not not unwieldy to incorporate the way we thought. So this felt right to be consulted. Um, the uh, Centre for Voluntary Organisations was holding seminars yeah, at LSE at that time. So we were doing that. But also... Um, Margaret Harris was writing research papers that had techniques in that we could nick. Yeah, so in terms of a community of interest, it was a loose one, it was a vibrant one that was happening because each was in influencing each other that way. And by that time, the MDN was probably about 30, yes, who was beginning to grow. Uh, and as the other organisations grew, as the state got interested, as organisations consolidated, they needed us freelancers more. So we scaled up more. What I didn't realise at the time was happening is we were returning, some of us were remaining generalists, others were getting specialist. Yeah, we were beginning to move in different directions. But also it was possible to get DOSH for, for management development. Some, some very sensible uh, funders funded how you worked, and how organisations developed strategies and all that stuff then. And, so, and it was also a time when a myriad of toolkits were born. <laughs> and <laughs> lie on shelves. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. There's lots of them. Um, and the Management Development Unit, SNCVO, under Tim Dartington, was hugely important for seminars and... No? It was actually under Patrick Wright. That, well, yeah. Tim, Patrick and then Tim, yes. Yeah, and Tim actually, I mean, they did have a brokerage function for consultants. Yes, we didn't, didn't... It didn't work, but they did. No, we didn't approve of it, to be honest. No, but it did exist. It did exist, yes. Yeah, it but it's, well, yes. They still have a list of preferred... Mm -hmm. Yes, they, 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 they tried... Into a commercial yes, yeah. and they, they flirt with it. They have flirted with it many times. You can tell that I have deep respect for this approach. Um, it does mean you have to pay to be part of it. But I do accept it was Patrick Wright, yeah? And then, then, then Tim. I think it's because, yes, it, we were born out of Tim's work, Tim's um, yeah. seminars. Uh, but Patrick before that, another um, social historian. Uh, also in that period... And now I only realise it in retrospect, was that a lot of organisations, community, small community, what Barry Knight would have called, and you will call, mutual aid organisations, were heavily encouraged to incorporate. So you had that collision of mutual aid and charity. So they developed, and so you got that real mush-mush of muddle about it, and what was management committees doing who didn't manage, and yeah, the beginning of, of, I think, something quite problematic. But it was a very exhilarating time, lots of coordinating with Patrick and Tim, and with um, the OU, and also various universities were setting up diplomas and then certificates in management development. And some of our people were doing the London Business School's um, um, own management masters, just showing that they could do that. Some of them were very proud. 
Um, see, page five, page five, yes, page five. Um, or what else was happening in terms of the richness of things? What I hadn't quite got was while we were busy trying to help them adapt to the changing assumptions about management, and we are beginning now to talk big, big M management, the regulators, funders were expecting to see people have, and this sounds pathetic to you, but it's significant to me, which is we were expect, they were expecting us and organisations were expecting us to help them with strategic or business plans. And it was a significant shift because up to that time, we didn't talk that way. Yeah, we talked about being organised and having, you know, do not you're doing, number of, do you got goals and all that. But there was a real shift when people start saying, have you got the business plan? Mm -hmm. And people would ring up and say, do you do business plans? And I'd say, what do you mean? And they would say, well, if you don't know, I don't want you. So <laughs> it was very distressing. And so the notion of strategic planning and lots of toolkits arrive. Richard Gutch, Richard Gutch, NCVO, yes, I was in a meeting with him because he'd gone to America to find out how they did it, and other things as well, because they were also going through these processes. And he brought people back here for seminars and things. And I remember sitting there with him and the American, who I'm sorry I can't remember the name of, he was asked, what in the end is the value of management committees come trustees, yeah? And he was quiet for a moment, and he said, governance. And we said, excuse me? Pardon? Because we didn't use that language then. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Was it Kolmolovsky? That would be about right, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, you need, you need these committees, yeah, for governance. What And we said, what's governance? And he said, <clears throat> it's two things, yeah? It's oversight and strategic planning. And it's to make sure that the chief officers don't run away with the organisation, yeah? And mess it up. Now, that's what had been happening in the private sector. There may have been five things, but there was enough worry in the private sector with, with chief officers having not only pay, but having share capital were at times making decisions about the fate of the organisations that were advantageous to their share capital and not to the stakeholders, yeah? And so they would merge and do all sorts of things that wasn't in the end the best of the organisation. So there was a feeling that something needed to be put in place that contained and focused the chief officers. And if that happened in the private sector, then it ought to happen in our sector because that was the trip-down effect. So what they started talking about was <clears throat> this new thing called governance, <clears throat> which everybody worried about what it was, except now it was born, we couldn't pop it back, yeah? We couldn't put it back in the bottle. But it was born as what committees were for. Because up till then, I would challenge you, I would challenge you to, to show me that we talked about governance, to learn, you know, when you read Trollope or, you know, um, George Eliot's March, yes? Ma Middle Arch, you know, where they talked about committees and whatever, all the stuff that you know. They didn't talk about governance. They had directors who, you know, checked the linen. I've learned that from you. So they didn't, they didn't do strategy. So there was a big moment when I think I never realised till then we were close to people saying, perhaps we don't need volunteer boards anymore. Yeah? Because who was fighting for them anyway? Well, NCBO wasn't. Yes, Akivo, Akivo, interested, yes, interested in the chief officer. And so there was a real drive that chief officers not having a huge respect for these voluntary boards, yeah, thinking perhaps we could do without them. And so we were close to that when it turns out that they are to be watched over. Yeah, we had to have oversight. But also this new thing called governance, which was strategic and therefore we needed to read plan. Now that didn't go down very well with my collectives. My collectives were not strategic yet. They had hard enough time keeping going and anyway, not getting at each other. So it was a terrible time, and you'll see this on five, when um, Landry and co. wrote a book called What a Way to Run a Railroad, 
which was devastating in its attack on collective and cooperative working. Now, you could argue if one book can knock down a whole edifice, the edifice wasn't very strong, and the edifice was not strong. There had been huge dilemmas about running uh, collectives, partly because they washed their laundry, in, their dirty laundry in public. And the other one was we didn't understand how to best organise them. And just at that time, and I'm being totally romantic, Helen Brown wrote a book about women organising. It was like we were getting there about how to run flat-ish organisations when they were wiped out. And certainly the university, with all its collective back, with its co-op background, saw things in terms of structures, yeah, because co-ops are structured organisations, not in, as in collectives. Some of the housing associations that had hung on to collective working went down and switched, like the Solons, yeah? Mm -hmm. but they were, we were, by this time, we're talking a lot of money. We're talking 23, 24 staff. I mean, it's not a group that you can hold, yeah? easily, but also the March of Equality is quite rightly asking about what happens to women, what happens to people of colour. It was too complex a way to run the world for something that was so loose as a collective. So they imploded. And quite a few, I didn't realise until later when a study was done of women's aids, a lot of them just simply went under the radar. Yeah? And they kept going in very small groups under the radar doing work with women who are experiencing violence, yeah, which was just about funded and re-emerged later in the 90s, still going, toughened old warriors, yeah, mm -hmm. to grow very fast as they are now. So they didn't go away, but there are a lot of issues, but there are some very interesting issues for people like me about how an organisation exists effectively that's a middle model of values and structures. Because here was an organisation that was essentially flat, but actually had a hierarchy, was it registered as a charity, yeah? When the care inspectorate comes in and says, you have to have levels of supervision, you're with me, how, how do they maintain those things? And I leave that with you to find out in part, yeah? Before you turn the page, I'm looking at the clock. Ooh. Oh, shit. I apologise. <laughs> so, um, so uh, can I just then say five, ten, yeah. five minutes, if you'll forgive me for five minutes. So carry on for a bit, yes. Yeah, five minutes. Another ten minutes or so. But so I'll make... Have time. <coughs> I'll have time to talk with you. Yes, uh, yes otherwise all you'll hear is me. Um, nine. I'll go for nine. Um, can I go take you on to six? Mm. It's, and this is, this is the sad bit. So I'll only give it nine minutes. <laughs> which is we are in danger of being totally seduced, yeah, as a sector, as a group of people. You see on the left, the state intervenes and colonises. The state intervened. The state now is being very, very interested in the functioning of launch organisations. Down here in England and Wales, 90 million was spent uh, to increase the capacity of third sector organisations to take over much of the public sector functioning within that broader framework of public management in which much of the welfare state was provided on a kind of supply chain within what Marion Taylor and others looked at, which is called the independent sector, which would be a mixture of private and, and third sector, yeah, providing for care and all things. So they begin to colonise voluntary action, which Colin has written about, yeah, but they also begin to colonise the notion of management and begin to talk about it very much in terms of strategic planning and hierarchies. Uh, by this time, so many organisations no longer have managers and coordinators. They have, they have direct, because they're incorporated, they have people who call themselves boards of directors, who are in fact trustees, yeah, who would have been called management committees. The people who are in, in hierarchy are now called chief officers, and then are now called chief executive officers, yeah. The language shift is very significant through time, and we have now more and more management teams. So that stratification is happening. Uh, so a lot of devol devolving to third sector, the growth of localism, because we have the, um, we're preparing for asset transfer. The speech, the talk, uh, and Rob Patton talks about this, is uh, a preoccupation with accountability. So regulation, the regulators are now actively colonising the sector. 
They're beginning to shape it. The Charity Commission, Oscar up in Scotland, is beginning now to say, this is what you're for. This is what a board is for. This is how the board is to account for itself, yeah? So, um, SORP, this is, for those of you who are account... Yes, Jim. Okay. Um, SORP is the statement of, of recommended practice, which is how you are to account, yeah? Don't go there. It's very <laughs> dangerous. But in effect, it's a statement of required practice by accountants. Somewhere in a bunker, working this out, yeah, for small firms and others. And they have already said very clearly, you not only account for your money, you must give your annual report, you must say what your goals are, you must report on their goals. And soon they will be saying, we want to know what your chief officer is paid, yeah, and we want to know whether they've got a car. And this is because they are now responding to the various um, media dramas around the kids' cup, kids' club, yeah, they're responding to those things. So they're beginning to seriously influence, you could say, challenge the independence of what independent charities are meant to be. Yeah? So that force is coming. The Care Inspectors Care Commission is already beginning to decide what's best in terms of protecting children and the elderly. A lot of it is very important. But they are telling independent organisations how they are to structure and organise. Yeah? So the sector is becoming very shaped by regulators, but also so are funders who now want business plans, strategic plans, yeah, in great detail to monitor. So the freelancers, if you'll see the middle counter, the freelancers are responding. The freelancers are doing it for them. Are you with me? They're now adjusting, reforming to do all that. And by this time, the Management Development Network is 90 people are up part of this network. It's huge. For our things. So there's a huge cultural shift, the language has changed, management committees are board of directors, there's real questionings about the role of, of um, volunteers as managers. Nobody owns, say in Scotland, nobody owns volunteers who are on boards. Yes, SCVO, <coughs> the equivalent of your, your NCVO, doesn't own them because they're volunteers. Volunteer Scotland doesn't own them, yeah? Because they're in governance, yeah? They fall between stores, they don't interest anyone. And by this time, many of my colleagues and me are talking standards, quality standards, yeah? Are talking accreditation, kite marks. What we're not talking is values. We're not, talk we're not back to who's it for, yeah? It's now talking about things that are outside driven, which is how do people uh, um, become an IIP, investors in people, yes? And now IIV, and I don't want to run them down, they're all relevant, but they're all penetrating and they're all things that we end up doing to make money, yeah? And there's all these people who will pay us to do it. Are you with me so far? Yeah. At this time, and this is Alison's word, is other things like the, the certificates in management, yeah, are dissolving. We're losing them. The connectedness between practitioners and researchers are dissolving. The MDN keeps up some of its seminars, but the, com the community interest is breaking down. This, yeah? we're, we're, we're fragmenting, we're becoming specialists, the generalists are losing it, and there's real worry about whether we are in some ways colluding. And I, I suspect, Colin, if you rewrote voluntary action, yeah, one of the issues is whether us, some of us freelancers colluded with that, yeah? that march, though I could argue as well with you. Seven, then, okay, what happens with all this, yeah? It goes to hell. We're not entirely in a handcart. Yes. So, one of the issues is, did we, did we do a good job to help organisations survive and help them adapt, yeah? Or whether we polluted? Um, what's interesting, the special topics at top of seven, workers' co-ops, mutual... What's interesting, the government has got interested again, though I'm, it might be losing it, in co-ops, mutuals. They were thinking of setting up mutuals for people with disability that could run transport, yeah? They hoped it would wash their faces, but they didn't. Um, they reinvested in flattened organisations, hoping they'd be cheaper. Uh, the rape crisis England and Wales was particularly liked because it's worked to always try and keep a flattened form of organising. Uh, and what happened with women's organisations, which are hardly surviving, housing associations have gone completely the other way down here, become huge, yes, become bigger than some public sector housing would have been. 
And there are two challenges from various organisations you would read about who are asking if they are any longer independent organisations, yeah, whether they're too big and challenges from their tenants as well. And up in Scotland, the regulator, the Scottish housing regulator, now says they represent the tenant. And therefore, yes, that is up to the boards to account to them. So it's a real switch. Um, I have escaped up north where it's colder, but it's in some ways there is a more flexible environment. Um, and found that up there in, <clears throat> in Glasgow, there is a million small housing associations because of the way it is being a much more left-wing organisation. And lots of them are very local, made up with very local people and are thriving and do lots of action learning with them and have got back to working with charitable collectives, developing toolkits. I'm trying to keep faith in that respect. Um, in the Management Development, Work, Development Network is probably now about 30 people. Yeah? So we're diminishing. So as you can see, um, there is a sense of... Um, of a sweep of time, an arc of time. And it would be misunderstanding us to argue that we rose with the need to formalise organisations, um, betrayed ourselves in, with management and professionalism and died out. Uh, I think in some ways we became very professional in the way we delivered. And the issue now is what kind of professionalism is appropriate to keep delivering that support to the sector. Thank you.